medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram COVID-19 update. Today, we're going to talk about a paper that was just published looking at long COVID and interferon. Hi, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt. I'm the co-founder of MedCram.com, where we have continuing medical education accessible to MDs, nurses, PAs, respiratory therapists, pharmacy students, even EMTs. Join us at MedCram.com to get those informational videos. If you need continuing medical education units or are just curious or you want to know more about a particular disease, join us at medcram.com. So let's briefly talk about the immune system. The immune system is made up of the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. The adaptive is the part of the immune system that makes antibodies and takes a little while for it to identify the antigen and then form antibodies against it. However, today we're going to talk about the innate immune system. And the innate immune system is important because it recognizes certain molecules as being foreign. And one of the major defense mechanisms that the innate immune system has against viruses in general is something called interferon, or IFN, as we'll talk about. And we've talked about this before. It's something that's important in terms of fighting COVID and SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. There's been a number of articles about interferon and viruses in general and the fight for supremacy. We've covered this before. The type 1 interferon response is important not only in SARS-CoV-2, but in the original SARS virus and also in MERS. And what has been emerging is evidence that if you cannot mount a good interferon response, you typically get more critical types of disease, whereas higher interferon responses acutely in COVID-19 leads to more mild cases. A number of papers have been published in the journal Science looking at this, and you can see here that patients who had severe types of COVID-19 had inborn errors of signaling of interferon. The signaling was pretty low, and the interferon alpha in patients with COVID-19 were very low. In those that had antibodies against interferon, their course was also very severe. The quote here is that together, these two papers that looked at the inborn errors of type 1 response and autoantibodies explain nearly 14% of all of the severe COVID-19 cases in that cohort. The question, though, is not about acute COVID-19 today. We're actually going to talk about long COVID or persistent COVID-19 and a lot of the symptoms that go along with that, such as fatigue, shortness of breath, muscle aches, etc. There's been a couple of papers that have looked at this. One of the papers was the question of whether or not antibodies against interferon might be the reason for people to have long COVID. There actually has been a paper that is published on that topic. And in this paper, which was not the one that we're talking about today, but was published back in 2023, what they found here is that five long COVID patients and three in the control groups actually had detectable circulating type 1 interferon autoantibodies. And so the conclusion was they did not see, at least in this cohort, a causation for long COVID from type 1 interferon autoantibodies. We have reviewed data that has shown that SARS-CoV-2 has a gene called MAC1, which actually prevents the host from making interferon. When they looked at specific types of bronchial cells and alveolar cells, they noticed that the wild-type virus, which had the ability to make the gene product of MAC1, caused lower levels of interferon in the cells that they looked at, whereas when they used the deletion gene, the ones that could not make the gene product, there were higher levels of interferon, at least in the acute phase. But again, what we're looking at here is long COVID. But I'm setting this up so you understand the importance of interferon, at least early on, in trying to get rid of the virus. Even more evidence in acute COVID-19. This was a randomized controlled trial of almost 2,000. And what they found specifically was that a single subcutaneous injection of pegylated interferon lambda reduced the hospitalization rate by 50% highlighting the need for an interferon response acutely when the patient develops an infection with SARS-CoV-2 and then gets COVID-19. We also showed how this was related to fevers and how at specific temperatures, the body can release very high levels of interferon gamma, specifically at 39 degrees Celsius or about 102 degrees Fahrenheit.
It was also the basis for me theorizing that potentially hydrotherapy or raising the body's temperature, at least not treating fevers reasonably, so long as the fevers didn't get too high, could be a possible strategy, at least acutely, in people with COVID-19 infections. So with that in mind, let's move on to long COVID. This is people persistently having symptoms of COVID. That would be headaches, fatigue, brain fog, shortness of breath, muscle aches, things of that nature. And this paper that was published by a Russian group in about 47 patients, what they found is that the post-COVID period was characterized by a less pronounced degree of inhibition of antiviral activity. So we know that the virus reduces interferon and that after the post-COVID period, that that suppression of interferon is somewhat relaxed. They go on to say here that patients with a more severe form of COVID-19 have lower levels of type 1 and type 2 interferon. But they say here that recovery of interferon status reveals positive dynamics up to seven months after disease, but that even a longer period of time might be required for full recovery of functionality of interferon. So interestingly, in these patients, not necessarily with long COVID, but in patients who have had post-COVID syndrome, as they name it here, there was a reduction in interferon in these patients. And that's interesting as well because there's this paper that was published in Nature that looked at 93,000 samples from 90,000 people living in 66,000 households. This was in the UK from November of 2020 to August of 2022. When they were first sampled and being positive, they were sampled once every week for four weeks and then once a month thereafter. A number of these people who had been infected were persistently infected and still had viral antigens circulating. It says here, of the 381 persistent infections that we identified among participants of the ONSCIS, that is the Office of National Statistics in the UK, lasted for at least two months and two over six months. In some cases, the infecting lineage had gone extinct by the general population. By contrast, we only identified 60 reinfections by the same major lineage as the primary infection, suggesting that immunity to the same variant remains strong after infection, at least until the lineage has gone extinct. So 54 out of 381 persistent infections lasted at least two months. They go on, we estimate that one in a thousand of all infections, and potentially as many as one in 200, may become persistent with intermittent high viral loads for at least two months. The infection is suppressing interferon, and the interferon is somehow necessary to rid the body of persistent viral infection, specifically SARS-CoV-2. It would seem at least that perhaps increasing the amounts of interferon may help get rid of the last traces or remnants of that persistent infection. Let's see if the data bears that out. Now we come to our feature article that was published just recently here titled Spontaneous Persistent T-Cell Dependent Interferon Gamma Release in Patients Who Progress to Long COVID. So we're talking about long COVID specifically. This was a study that followed 55 patients with long COVID fatigue. This was after hospitalization for over two and a half years, starting in August of 2020 and ending in July of 2021. Severe long COVID symptoms lasting for at least five months after an acute bout of COVID-19. You can see here some of the results based on the blood test. And again, we're looking at interferon specifically. And if you compare the amount of interferon in people who are unexposed to those who are in long COVID, you'll see here very clearly that in long COVID, there are higher levels of interferon. So realize that interferon is used all the time in chronic hepatitis C. And when it is, it can cause symptoms that are very similar to long COVID. They're very nonspecific, but they are similar. Similar symptoms like fatigue, headache, muscle aches, body aches, lack of energy. And so the question is, could it be that this elevation in interferon is high enough to cause the symptoms persistently, but not high enough to get rid of the actual persistent infection? 
we can see in patients who had acute COVID-19, with the unexposed here being not exposed, and then day 28, we see an increase in interferon, and then at day 90, still elevated, and then finally, a reduction back down to the limits of detection here at day 180. That's literally half a year later at six months. If we look at that data once again, here are the unexposed, here are those that had the virus but recovered. We see that same data here, but at the same time period of 180 days or greater, we can still see that interferon levels are elevated and may be the cause of the symptoms of people with long COVID. If we look at people without long COVID, we can see here that there is definitely a statistically significant drop in interferon. However, interferon with people without recovery, and it seems as though it's all elevated, but it's always above the lower limits here of abnormal. And if you look at the symptoms in the cohort of patients in this study, you will see here what symptoms they had at their first visit and what symptoms they had at their final visit a lot of fatigue, that is the major symptom, a number of other different types of symptoms, and of course, being resolved is gonna be the most common at the final visit. Brain fog got better, fevers got better, a number of things didn't even exist, like cough, pneumonia, anosmia, myalgias, palpitations got better, rash stayed about the same, fatigue got significantly better. Headache actually got a little bit worse in these patients. So something that was interesting with these cohort of patients is that they got vaccinated. And some of these people got vaccinated either because the vaccines became available or they might have gotten vaccinated because they thought it might help with their symptoms as there was some data that was suggestive of that early on. They don't mention in the article which vaccine was used or how many times they were vaccinated, but they just looked at before and after they were vaccinated in terms of their symptoms there was a reduction after vaccination. Back to that graph, you can see here, before vaccination and after vaccination, there was an improvement. And one has to wonder whether or not vaccination boosted the adaptive immune system to help clear the virus so that the innate immune system didn't have to produce interferon and cause some of these symptoms that we're seeing here. Again, we're looking at interferon here before vaccination, after vaccination, and you can see here statistical significant drop in interferon levels. Before and after vaccination would have to do with time, and we can see here that with time there was a reduction in symptoms, so it's unclear whether or not there was an increase based on just time or actually vaccination. The other thing that is very clear is that compared to people at the beginning of the cohort versus those at the end, there was a drop in interferon levels. And you can see here that those that did recover, eventually the interferon levels did go down. This brings up a lot of interesting questions. Is the association between long COVID symptoms and high and elevated interferon levels and resolution of long COVID symptoms and low interferon levels, is that causative or is there something that's causing both? And I think that is a very good question. It is possible that a persistent infection in the body is causing the symptoms of long COVID because it is activating and increasing the body's response in the form of interferon, which is causing those symptoms. But that when that persistent virus is eliminated eventually, then the immune system is turning off that interferon and the symptoms are going away. The question at this point is whether or not increasing interferon would be beneficial by getting rid of the infection, or if binding or eliminating the interferon would get rid of the symptoms, but on the other hand, would make the infection worse. One thing of interesting note, the authors of the paper very specifically state that once the interferon was above a certain threshold, there wasn't a dose response curve in terms of the amount of interferon and the worsening of symptoms, meaning that if somebody had higher levels of interferon and therefore symptoms, increasing the interferon might not necessarily increase symptoms. At least there was no evidence of that in this publication. Just so everyone's clear, hepatitis C is also a similar situation to what we're seeing now in SARS-CoV-2. 
SARS-CoV-2 suppresses interferon production in the cells in the acute phase. And then in the persistent phase, we see an elevation in SARS-CoV-2, especially in long COVID patients, as we just talked about. The same thing happens here in hepatitis C. Notice it says hepatitis C virus inhibits interferon production in infected hepatocytes. Type 3 interferon production persists in HCV-infected cells. That's exactly what we're seeing in SARS-CoV-2. As a result, interferon lambdas are expressed at high levels in livers with chronic hepatitis C infections. Several studies have demonstrated in cell culture models that interferon lambdas were expressed at higher levels than interferon betas in hepatitis C infected cells. Later, it was found that only cells that are infected with hepatitis C express interferon lambdas. We have a situation where chronically infected cells with a virus that is persistent makes more interferon. And the question would remain here as well. Is it possible that giving more interferon would actually help get rid of the virus? And the clear answer in terms of hepatitis C is absolutely yes. We have known for years that the way that we used to treat hepatitis C, especially two and three genotypes, was exactly with pegylated interferon alpha plus ribavirin as well. So I would be careful in making the assumption that just because we see high levels of interferon in long COVID, that somehow the answer is to reduce the amount of interferon. Remember that in people who have infections in general, they get fevers. Let's not make the same mistake by assuming that simply by getting rid of the fever, as they did in the 1918 pandemic by dosing on aspirin, that this is somehow going to improve outcomes in influenza. There was an article about this research, and they said here in terms of classifying long COVID, this study argues that the presence of interferon gamma could be used to classify long COVID into subtypes, which could be used to personalize treatment. They say, quote, it's unlikely that all the different long COVID symptoms are caused by the same thing. We need to differentiate between people and tailor treatments. Some patients are slowly recovering, and there are those who are stuck in a cycle of fatigue for years on end. And we need to know why, Dr. Krishna said. Dr. Krishna is one of the authors of this paper. And for those that are interested in seeing where funding came from for this paper, I post this. And my thoughts on the topic are that clearly interferon is one of the very important markers of inflammation. It is one of the tools that the innate immune system uses to deal with SARS-CoV-2 viral infections. But I think this research is very important in understanding the effects of and the causes of long COVID. And based on this data, it's possible that many people who have long COVID symptoms are probably having those symptoms because of persistent viral infections. And if we can find some way of enhancing the immune system to deal with that persistent infection, that might be beneficial in terms of ending the long COVID symptoms. Obviously, more research needs to be done, and I'm sure that is in the process of being done. Don't forget to join us at medcram.com for more continuing medical education units. And these are useful for medical doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, PA students, pharmacy students, and respiratory therapists alike. Or if you're curious to learn more about diseases in general, join us at medcram.com.